So if you've ever watched a TV show and like me were annoyed at why in God's name you would have to turn the volume of the intro theme song so freaking loud. If you find that annoying like I do, then my friend, we're on the same page. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense why they would feel the need to do that. And sometimes what I do is it annoys me so much that I will literally grab the remote and turn the volume down just for the theme song. And then I can continue on watching The Office or whatever. And while that's of course a silly example, this is actually functionally what a compressor does. Put simply, a compressor turns the volume of a track down. But much like me using the remote to only turn it down for that intro theme song and then I'll turn it back up, a compressor turns down the loud parts of the track and the quieter parts remain completely unaffected. Now, one of the best definitions that I've personally heard of what a compressor does is by Graham Cochran, who used to run the recording revolution. And the way that he described a compressor is as an automated volume fader. So if you imagine a mixing board, like a physical board with faders everywhere, what a compressor does is you dial in the settings and then the fader automatically, based on the information and based on what you've dialed in, it will move up and down in a completely automated way. Now that may beg the question in your mind, well, what is the purpose of that? Why do we need this automated volume fader? Or why do we need to, as I like to say, grab a remote and turn down the damn intro music? What is the point of that in the context of music and in the tracks you're working on? Well, the main purpose, the number one purpose of compression, and I'll share two others as well, but the main purpose is to simply achieve a greater level of balance in your mix. So for example, if the quietest part of the vocal is here and the loudest part is here, what we're trying to do is to turn down that loud part so it's closer to the quietest part so that there's not this massive, you know, louder for the loud parts and then kind of everything gets off and then louder and it brings everything closer together. That is one thing, that's the main thing that compression does. It creates a greater sense of balance. And then a couple other things that compression does to the tracks that you add it to are punchiness. So if you use certain settings, you can perhaps use on your drums or on your snare drum, or even yes, on the vocal or any other track, if you just want a bit more of a punchy sound, you know, that doesn't quite sound so loose and kind of fading in and out. It's, it's got this punchy sound to it. You can use that on kick drums, snare drums, drums overall, vocals, anything like that. Punchiness is another effect that compression can add. Another effect that you can add by using certain settings on a compressor is smoothness. Almost that sense of cohesion, like the vocal or the guitar track or anything that you're using, it, it feels a bit more like it's consistent, like it flows better. It has more of a glued, focused sound to it. It doesn't feel quite as sporadic, if you will. Okay, so those are three reasons and three you could say effects that compression adds to the tracks that you add it to. Balance, um, punchiness, and smoothness. Sometimes it's a combination of the three, sometimes it's mainly balance, sometimes it's balance and punchiness, you get the point. Now, very quickly, before we get into the inner workings of a compressor and how to actually use the knobs and the parameters inside of your compressor, one thing I want to make very clear, and you may have this question, which is, how do I know which compressor to use? I mean, my God, there are a gazillion compressors out there from, from plugin companies like Waves or Slate Digital or UAD or Waves again, because they've got like 38 of them. And then you also have your stock compressors inside of your DAW. And if you are still relatively new to this, to compression or maybe to production overall or to DAWs overall, can I give you just a word of very simple advice? Please take this if you are especially in that beginner stage. Just use your stock compressor. It's a complete fallacy to believe that you need all the different compressors from Waves and Slate Digital and this analog model, blah, blah, blah. Just use what you got. Learn the skill. Learn how to use a compressor. And then from there, of course, you can go nuts and have the freedom. You always have the freedom to expand beyond that. But if you can master your stock compressor inside of whichever DAW you use, whether that's Ableton or like me, Studio One or Logic, they basically look all almost the same. They have 
essentially all the same knobs and I'm gonna walk you through what a typical stock compressor looks like and I'm gonna show you how to use and what each one of the knobs do. So my friend, just start small. Start with your stock compressor. Don't worry about what some other YouTuber is doing or some guy who's been mixing for 35 years and the different compression plugins they're using. Just master what you have. Start small, master that plugin, and then from there you can expand over time, okay? Now, let me walk you through the inner workings of a compressor plugin. Now, as I just mentioned, I use Studio One, but again, you can follow along in any DAW, okay? Just look at where it says threshold here, it's gonna say threshold with your stock plugin in Ableton or Logic or anything like that. And all of the parameters that I'm gonna walk you through, it's gonna be probably exactly the same, other than the exact layout of the plugin. It has all the same features that your stock compressor has. So the very first parameter that I'm gonna walk you through here is the threshold. In this plugin, we have the threshold knob right here. Now, what does the threshold actually do? What is the point of it? Well, if you imagine the volume level, so I soloed some drums here, let me play those. So as you can see here, we've got, you can see the audio levels come through. What a threshold does is it sets the level at which the compression will activate. So what is happening right now, because of where the threshold is set, this compression plugin is doing absolutely nothing. It's doing nothing at all to the sound, okay? But now watch what happens when I turn the threshold down. Do you notice how much more of a punchy sound that we got when I turned down the threshold? This is one of the effects, of course, that compression can add to your tracks. And just to be very clear here, when you turn down the threshold, the more you do that, the more that the audio signal goes above the threshold. And that is the point at which the compressor activates. Anytime the audio level, the audio signal goes above the threshold that you've set, that is what the compressor hits. That is what the compressor turns down. And that's why if the threshold is all the way up at zero, guess what? There's no compression happening. And so, Again, and then, but as we move it down, more and more compression. And this yellow bar here that you see bouncing around, that is giving us some visual feedback for how much this compressor is turning down those drums. So that's the threshold. It's a very, very important starting point. And one of the visuals that I like to use for the threshold is think of a hammer. So the threshold is like a hammer. It turns down everything that rises above the threshold. Okay, so if the sound goes above it, a hammer, bam, bam, turns it down, turns it down. Everything below, like if the signal, if it's just a hi-hat for that little space between the kick and the drum, or in this case, the ride cymbal, then that level perhaps doesn't cross the threshold, so the hammer doesn't activate. But then as soon as that kick or that snare hits and the level goes above the threshold, bam, bam, it activates and turns down that little part, and then it lets go again. And if I was to set this compressor here, let's just kind of, land on a little something, maybe. There we go. That's, it's um, turning it down by about 3 dB here on this bar and a bit more on the louder parts, three to four dB. So that'll work good. So now let's move on and let's talk about the next knob here, which is the ratio. Now, if the threshold is a hammer, that turns everything down that goes above the threshold, then what the ratio is, is the degree of force that is behind the hammer, okay? And that is what the difference is. So the default here with this compressor is a two to one ratio, which is a very common ratio, especially as a starting point for a lot of these compression plugins. A two to one ratio is a fairly mild force behind the hammer. So if the sound is rising above the threshold, it might just kind of, you know, bob it down a little lazily. It's still shooting it down, but not with a whole lot of force. The higher you go with the ratio, the more that hammer is like being forced down. It's like, the higher you go, the more Conor McGregor is grabbing that hammer and just going nuts with it over and over. And if you go all the way up to 20 to one, if you've ever used a limiter, 
you know, like on the mastering chain or when you want to get the max volume of your track, but you don't want to get that clipping distortion, people use limiters at the end of their mix or in the mastering phase. And the limiter ratio is usually 20 to one. So that is, again, that's big old or small old. I don't know how you would describe Conor McGregor. He's pretty, whatever, whatever that guy is. If he grabs the hammer at 20 to one, it is just forcefully, just absolutely slamming anything that rises above the threshold. And then again, if it's all the way down to like one and a half to one or two to one, it's a lot more soft. It's a lot more gentle and smooth with it. So let's stay with these drums here. Listen to what happens when we start with the ratio at two to one and then when I move it around. Notice how much more forceful it is. There, it's a bit more smooth. So there you go, that's what the ratio does. Now generally, I will keep my ratios between two to one, three to one, and four to one. So don't overthink it, just start there. Just stay in that ballpark for a while, get used to that, and then of course beyond that you can experiment. But just start between two to one and four to one, and you're good to go. So we've already talked about threshold and ratio. Now what I'm gonna do is move to a vocal track, just so we have a bit of differentiation so we don't just listen to the same drum track over and over. I want to give you examples across multiple tracks here. So what I'm going to do is add a compressor plugin to this dry vocal track. So here is what that vocal sounds like. Again, and I, I just wish, just wish you were here. Now, before we dive into the attack and release, let's quickly set the threshold here for this. So, we, so it's actually I compressing because nothing's happening wish right now. You were here. Again, and I, I just wish, just wish you were here. So that's good for now. We're doing about minus three, minus four on those louder peaks. And now let's talk about attack. And I'm going to keep using the hammer metaphor to explain this because I think it'll help make sense to you and it'll help you remember this information. So again, to reiterate, we've got the hammer, which is kind of like the threshold. It turns down everything that goes above the threshold in terms of the volume of the track that your compressor is on. Okay, so it turns it down. The ratio, again, is the force behind it. So if it's a two to one ratio, a bit more chill, and then anything above that just gets increasingly stronger and more forceful. Now, a fast attack time. So if we were to make this attack time fast, that would mean as soon as the volume of the track crosses above the threshold, if it's a very fast attack, that hammer is immediately shooting it down, immediately. With a fast attack, bam. Now a slower attack, the volume of the track rises above the threshold, the hammer doesn't immediately come down. It just waits a little and then it shoots it down. And it's a bit more of a smooth, it's less aggressive of an approach. So that is what a slow attack is. Fast attack immediately. Slow attack, it waits, a, it waits a little bit. It allows for a bit more of that naturalness and that musical quality to pop through, a bit more of the dynamics to have their way, and then it'll turn it down as well, but it's not quite as aggressive. And so I'm gonna show you here on this vocal track. We'll start the attack time at a fairly slow place, and then I'll bring no. it back. Let me turn this down a bit. I just wish you were here. That's fast. Again. And I, and that's slow. I just wish, just wish you were here. So that's the difference. A fast attack is more aggressive. It's more straightforward. It's more like, bam, just hit it immediately. Rises above the threshold, hammer hits it immediately. Slow attack, it, it's, it's a bit more like, it's a bit more jazzy in its approach. It's like, oh, just let it, let it go a little bit, you know? Let it hang out before you then still eventually, after a few more milliseconds, you do still hit it down but it's not quite as harsh, not quite as aggressive. And then finally, I want to also just give you some ballpark numbers for you to start with in terms of where should your attack time be. My attack times for most things tends to be between about one millisecond at you know being fast, so about here, or even all the way down to half, but let's just say one millisecond 
for a fast attack. And then a slow attack, I might have up between 100 to 200 milliseconds. Let's say between one millisecond and 150 milliseconds. That is generally where I will keep my attack times. And so one more time, if you want a smoother sound, you might wanna go with a little slower time. If you want a more aggressive, rockier sound, like just really grabbing that vocal and compressing it, you might wanna make the attack time a little closer to one millisecond, just a little faster. Okay, so now let's talk about the other side of this, which is the release knob. So attack, again, is how quickly it attacks the vocal after it crosses, or the sound rather, the audio, after it crosses the threshold. And then you could think of the release as when you are using the hammer to turn down those peaks that are crossing the threshold, the release tells the hammer how quickly to come back and let go of the audio, or uh, how long to stay and keep the audio pushed down with the hammer, or how quickly to just bring the hammer back to neutral. So a fast release is, bam, you hit the audio, and then it immediately lets go of it as soon as the audio goes back below the threshold. A slower release hits the audio that is above the threshold, and then even when the audio signal crosses goes below the threshold, the compression still stays activated for a bit longer before it lets go. And so I'll give you an example of that now. So if we come back to this vocal track, and if we start with a fast release, this is what it sounds like. Cause all I just wish you were here. Let me exaggerate this even more with the threshold so you can really hear it. So again, fast release. Again, and I, and then slow. I just wish, just wish you were here. So as you can hear on that extremely slow release, this compression, this yellow bar stays on it, right? Ooh, what a time, it's not letting go, time, it's just, what a time, what a you know, time it was. versus, look what happens here. Oh, oh, I, I know it comes right back. Stupid. Bam, bam. All, See that? I just wish you were here. Now, as far as tone quality and the effect that it has on the audio signal when you adjust the release knob, if you're going for a relatively natural sound, then you might wanna have a fast to medium release time, which might be between five or 10 milliseconds at a fast, and then maybe around 30 or 40 in the medium range for your release time. And then if you want your track to be almost more smooth and have a sense of glueiness about it, almost like a gooey sound, if that makes sense, I don't know. Um, then you might wanna have a bit of a slower release, just so again, that hammer, it stays on it a bit more, and it just has a different effect from a fast release to a slow release. Now on a vocal like this, I would generally be between 10 milliseconds for a fast release on a vocal, all the way up to perhaps 100 for a slow release. Now, one more thing I wanna show you when it comes to release though, is let's quickly head back to that drum or to those drum tracks, because I wanna show you what it can sound like when you use a slow release on a snare drum in particular. So if we look at this snare drum here, and let me, yeah, I'll just leave it on here, it's fine. And if we go like this, and if we adjust the, Fast release, and then if we come back here. Do you notice how different the sound is? Versus fast release, slow release. Boom, boom, right? Now in solo, the fast release sounds so much better, right? But in the context of a really dense mix or a heavy metal mix or, or something like that, you can really play with this release knob on like a snare drum or perhaps even your drums overall like we were doing before on the drum bus where all the drums were going through. But even on an individual snare track, this is a, this is a very common thing to do is to play with the release knob of the compressor on the snare drum. Because as you can hear, it's such a drastically different sound from this. Uh, from this to this. So there you go. That is the power of the release knob. Now there's one more thing I wanna show you inside of a stock compressor and we're gonna come back to this vocal track for this and that is makeup gain. Now very quickly, you might be asking why didn't I talk about the knee or why didn't I talk about the side chain or some other thing or knob or parameter that you may have in your stock compressor. 
The reason I didn't talk about them is because I don't care about them. The main things you need to know are just threshold, ratio, attack and release, and then makeup gain like we're about to talk about. But please, when you're starting out, don't worry about everything else. Don't worry about the knee. Like It doesn't make a big difference. It's fine. Who cares? Don't worry about side chain compression for now. Don't worry about, you know, do I want auto or adaptive? Do I want uh, look ahead or not? Or whatever comes with it. Just stick to the basics. Master what you have with threshold, ratio, attack, and release, and then the makeup gain, and then you're set. Don't worry about anything else for now. Okay, makeup gain, let's get into it. Now, depending on the compressor, it might say makeup like it does here, or it just might say gain or output or output gain. Every compressor like this has some type of output gain or makeup gain knob. So here's what makeup gain does. Remember when I said that compression turns down the volume of everything, of course, that crosses the threshold, that's what we've been talking about. What makeup gain does is it compensates for the turning down of the volume. Because you may have noticed, whenever I would turn the threshold down, the volume would get lower and lower and lower. And so the makeup gain compensates for that loss in volume by turning everything back up again. It literally makes up for the lost volume, hence makeup gain. Now, here is where the magic happens, okay? So as we've already discussed, the compressor is only activated when the audio level crosses the threshold and rises above it. That's when the compressor, that's, that's when the hammer activates. That's when the compressor activates. But when the audio signal is below the threshold, nothing is being touched. Everything is staying exactly the same. So when you use makeup gain, when you turn the volume of the overall track back up to compensate for the lost volume of compressing the track, you not only turn back up those parts that you turn down from the compression, you also turn up everything that was not compressed to begin with. Does that make sense? So I'll give you a little visual here of what happens when you use compression and makeup gain. If your track starts out and the loudest part of the track is here and the quietest part is here, what happens is the compressor, the hammer that we talked about, it'll shoot the loud part or the loud parts down to say perhaps here. So now it's no longer from here to here, it's from here to here. What makeup gain does is it grabs this range and it just goes whoop, it turns everything up. That is what makeup gain is. And that is why compression makes your track sound punchier, sound more in your face, sound more balanced, sound more full. It's because there's more of that consistency. There's, it's not as much of from this, you know, to this, and then this, and then this, and then this. No, everything is whoop, and then you turn everything up with the makeup gain. So let me show you here inside of this vocal on this compressor plugin, and I'll show you how the makeup gain looks. I just wish you were here again. And I, I just wish, just wish you were here. So there's without the compressor. Oh, what a time, what a time, what a time, what a time it was. Oh, oh I, I know it's stupid. So as you can hear there, the volume level of the sound before it hits the compressor is now almost the same as after it goes through the compressor. And we made that, we got that evenness to it because we turned up the makeup gain to make up for the lost volume that we turned down from the compression to begin with, okay? Now there's one more thing I wanna talk about here in this video, and that is compression presets. And I'm about to dive into that, but I do wanna quickly mention though, if you have not yet downloaded my free guide, The Seven Steps to a Killer Indie Song, I think you should do it. It's a great resource, it's 100% free. I'll leave a link in the description and I'll talk more about this at the end of the video. So let's just dive into the compression presets now. So the overall question is, is it okay to use compression presets? Is it a sin? Like, is it okay? Well, the short answer is yes, actually. You can use compression presets, but, and this is a very big but, I'm not gonna lie about this one, okay? There is one massive problem with using compression presets. And that problem is the person who made that preset has no idea, they have no way of knowing what the audio level is of the track that you just put that compression preset on. 
And so yes, you can experiment with compression presets, but there's one thing you always, always, always have to do, and that is come into your threshold and adjust the threshold to adapt to or to match up with where your volume level is for the track that you just added the compressor to. And I'm gonna show you why that's important. So let's come over to an acoustic guitar track that I pulled in here. So I have a little acoustic guitar track here. Let me add, again, just the stock compressor. Here's what the acoustic guitar sounds like. Now, as you probably know, there's no compression happening, right? Because the threshold is too high, this bar is not coming down. But what's gonna happen if we add a little preset, right? So if we go into guitar and we're like, don't really know what we're doing with compression, so we just go, oh, acoustic guitar one. Let's just add uh, some compression to it. Let's see how that sounds. And we're like, oh yeah, it sounds so much better. That doesn't sound that much better. Pretty much the only thing this compressor is doing is turning the volume up because of the makeup gain over here. So it's adding like 7 dB of volume. Because here's before, and there's after. Now there is a teensy tiny little bit of compression popping through on some of the louder strums, as you can see here in this, with this yellow bar. But for the most part, that audio is not going above the threshold, and so there is hardly any compression happening at all. And this is the problem with presets. You can't just add a preset and then go on with your day. You always have to come into the threshold and adjust the threshold to the general audio level of the track that it's on. Maybe the snare drum is really loud, so then it's gonna be at a completely different place, the threshold is, than if it's on a softer acoustic guitar or a soft vocal versus a loud vocal. You always have to adjust the threshold to match the needs of the particular tracks that you are adding the compressor to. All right, so in this case, I would probably bring this down to about here. So I actually only brought it down about two to three dB more than it was, but that actually matters. These little details, these differences between the threshold at minus 18 to minus 21, that is a big difference if at minus 18, just once in a while, it's it kind of compresses versus at minus 21, now it compresses at two to three dB perhaps consistently. That's a big difference, okay? And so yes, the answer is you can 100% lean on compression presets, you can experiment with them, and one of the great things that presets help you with is to get a feel for attack and release. So you could perhaps browse through the guitar presets or the snare drum or the kick drum presets or the drum bus presets or the vocal presets just to kind of get a feel for where the attack time and the release times tend to be and just, you know, use that as education. Get informed on what your potential moves could be um, just based on where the presets are, specifically attack and release. Okay, so my friend, this was a pretty in-depth workshop on compression. I really hope you enjoyed it. Now, if you wanna dive deeper into producing indie music, that's what I teach here at the Indie Music Lab, how to produce indie songs, indie rock, indie pop, indie folk, these types of genres. If you wanna get better at that, I have a free guide for you. It's called The Seven Steps to a Killer Indie Song. I will leave a link in the description below. Be sure to check that out before you head out. And if you still have a question about compression, because I'm not gonna pretend that I make perfect videos, I tried hard to make this one good, but I'm sure there are some things I left out. I'm sure there are still some unanswered questions. So be sure to leave those questions in a comment below and I'll get back to you, okay? Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.